Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Victor, and I'm here today to talk to you about the state of the Filecoin ecosystem. Um, so I thought it would be good to start maybe with a timeline. Aaron gave us a little bit of a background, but maybe this can help contextualize. Uh, so actually, in 2014 was when Filecoin had its first white paper. Juan Benet, the founder of Protocol Labs, put that out. Uh, it turns out uh, between 2014 and 2017, there was a massive amount of research that we had to do uh, when we were really trying to think about what would it be required to build an internet scale storage system. In 2017, a revised version of the Falcon white paper came out along with the Falcon Saft. Fast forward between 2017 and 2020, and a lot of the work that was going on was taking that theory that was laid out in that uh, second white paper and putting it into practice. And on October 15th of 2020 is when the network actually launched. 2022, uh, skipping a little bit over, uh, many upgrades happened in between. We'll touch a little bit on what the accumulation of that work actually entailed. But in 2022, we saw a number of pretty interesting features come live. Uh, first, the FVM actually launched at the base layer of Filecoin. That set the stage for things that can't, will come and have come in 2023. The Computer for Data Working Group formed, as, as did the Retrieval Market Working Group. And Saturn, uh, one of the first uh, Filecoin retrieval markets, went into its alpha. In 2023, although we're only in April, um, the FEVM has gone live. This is the first time that people can deploy user programmable smart contracts on the Filecoin network. Later this year, we have Saturn's mainnet coming, as well as IPC, which stands for Interplanetary Consensus. So if you'd stop paying attention to Filecoin and maybe 2017 or 2020 when the network launched, it may be a little bit confusing or surprising to see that we have all of these other things coming on the roadmap. So for today's talk, my goal is to hopefully give a little bit of clarity as to why all these other components exist, how they fit together, and what you have to look forward to. So people may have seen a talk Juan gave about Filecoin's master plan. This is essentially a three-step plan to figure out how do we bring internet scale infrastructure to the internet writ large. This is not saying Web3 as a subset of the internet. This is saying, how do we make it possible to take the infrastructure that we normally deploy on, deploy on the cloud and actually deploy it on protocols uh, that are running on top of Web3? So part one of this plan is what we started with, which was scalable data storage. How do we build the infrastructure that allows us to deploy hardware that can support internet scale capacity? This is both from at a blockchain level, so like how do we make it possible to have services that anchor into a blockchain that can then make sure that they're being rendered properly uh, with those services being able to support uh, large scale capacity, um, but also literally attracting the hardware to make it possible for if someone comes with petabytes of data to be able to put that onto the network and support it. The second part of this plan was, making, uh, was adding massive amounts of data onto the network. So once you have exabytes of capacity and an open market, you create the incentives to make uh, data onboarding incredibly cheap for clients just purely through competition. Part of the reason why massive on, uh, data onboarding is important is it sets the stage both for investment in the infrastructure that makes onboarding easier, so storage on ramps that make it possible to go after specific use cases, but it also helps seed the network with useful data that can then be later used to bring future revenue streams to the network overall, whether that be through retrieval, through compute, or other data services like renewal over time. The last piece is actually bringing utility to the data. So saying, once you have all of this data sitting on these hard drives on the Filecoin network, how do we start replicating the services that you expect out of cloud services? So this includes things like building a permissionless CDN so you can get super fast retrieval, bringing different types of compute to the data itself so you can start building new and more unique transformations so you can generate the insights or the applications that you care about, and then being able to compose that through programmability to be able to string these services together to have the data land back in the network and create a virtuous circle. So in totality, this is the fa three phases that we've been running through. These are not mutually exclusive. Uh, part one does not mean that we have stopped, or moving on to part two, or part three doesn't mean that we've stopped on part one or part two. Um, but really, these are just showing you at, we're at like different levels of maturity in each of these components. So my goal for the rest of this talk is to double click into each of these parts to give a little bit more color where we are, and especially for part three, where there's the most that's coming up on the horizon, give you a bit of a lay of the land of how these things work and how they connect. So for part one, scalable data storage. To date, Filecoin has about 3,600 uh, storage provider IDs that are live on the network. In totality, this comprises about 12 exabytes of storage capacity spread out across over 40 countries. 
Now, just to put a pin uh, in this conversation, I think one thing that's really fascinating about this is like this is genuinely cloud level scale of infrastructure that we're talking about. This is not like us theoretically claiming that Filecoin can support internet scale hardware. It is doing it today. You can go check a block explorer and see it for yourself. This is important because as we get to the future parts of the roadmap, we can see that having all of this capacity makes it possible for us to start tackling Web2 use cases and bringing on uh, third parties that maybe are not normally a part of Web3 and make them actual consumers of Web3 services. Part two that I mentioned was massive data onboarding. You can see in this chart at the bottom how this has gone. Um, one of the unique superpowers that Filecoin has as a crypto incentivized network is we can leverage incentives to help invest in the infrastructure that we need to cross the chasm to bring uh, our technologies to market. What you're seeing at the bottom with Filecoin Plus is the effort of tons of groups working together to build the tooling, to build the on-ramps, to do the business development, to acquire Web2 datasets, to bring them onto the network, to create more and more utility for the network at large. Um, I'll call out that this isn't exclusively focused on one category or another. You see that Berkeley, CERN, uh, there's a number of other Web2 organizations as well. They're putting petabytes of large-scale data sets, and purely because it's not because Filecoin is some special philosophically interesting thing. It's because we can offer a cheaper service than the cloud incumbents but can by themselves. On top of that, we also have traditional Web3 use cases. You see folks like Gala Games, Club NFT, Magic Eden, all of them using Filecoin as a verifiable storage layer on top of the, uh, the IPFS network. So this slide, my goal here is to maybe help contextualize how parts one and two really focus on the bread and butter of the base layer of Filecoin, and maybe hopefully explain why we needed to start with storage markets. But if you look at Filecoin's roadmap and all the things that we're building, it expands much further than just the storage by itself. Um, so now, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to go through each of these buckets to just give a quick overview of how each of these components work, what stage of maturity they're at, and how they fit together. So first, to the retrieval markets. So if folks had read the Filecoin white paper, in 2017, there's actually a section where we talk about the retrieval markets. It's a little bit under spec compared to what we have today, but I think the core principles still stand. Um, the first was an insight about content addressing. The content addressing, for those who are unfamiliar, is how both IPFS and Filecoin reference data. Rather than talking about data living in a specific location, we talk about a verifiable fingerprint, a hash of the data, as the canonical reference. One of the nice things about content addressing means I can serve data off of untrusted servers, and I can verify on the client side that it's the data that I was looking for. Content addressing plus crypto incentives. Um, the other thing that retrieval markets leverage are crypto incentives. With crypto incentives, we can permissionlessly aggregate resources to deliver something greater than the sum of the parts by itself. A good example of this you can see in the storage market as it exists today. As I mentioned in the previous slide, we have 3,600 providers collectively providing 12 exabytes of storage capacity. Individually, none of them can compete with a large hyperscaler, but in aggregate, they can compete collectively as a network. The same principle applies, we believe, to retrieval markets, except instead of storage, we're talking about bandwidth. In aggregate, we can build up a virtual CDN uh, comprised of many different participants working together um, using crypto incentives and delivering content address data. Now, the reason these two things are actually unique superpowers is because when we talk about CDNs and you think about the incumbents, whether it be Cloudflare or Akamai, it is a giant game of who can get the data centers closest to the end user. What we really want is to be able to cache data as close as physically possible because then you can shave down the latency as much as you can. If you think about all the things I've just sort of laid out here, crypto incentives give us the ability to build and bootstrap overnight a CDN that can be comprised not of one company and their ability to spend billions of dollars, but of thousands of companies working collaboratively together. And from the user side, I don't have to trust that all of these thousands of companies are good actors. I can just verify the data that's coming back to me to make sure that I'm not getting malware or anything like that. And this is the thesis of DCDNs in general. So the retrieval market is a broad category in the Filecoin ecosystem. I'll talk about one that's in the works. I had mentioned Filecoin Saturn. You can see on a map, on the right here. Uh, this is in Filecoin Saturn's alpha, the distribution of their nodes. To date, they have uh, about 20, uh, 2,100 points of presence. Um, they have about 15 teams that are working on this. There's different teams working on different subcomponents of what is required for a retrieval market. And in aggregate, I think Saturn today has about 5% of the bandwidth of Cloudflare. 
and although that may seem like we're kind of far off, it's important to note this is over a handful of months that we're talking about that they've been able to aggregate this number of resources. This is without being, without being on mainnet, without their full incentives. And I think this is the sort of thing that to me is the most exciting. Um, where you see those numbers for a time to first byte, uh, which is like how fast does the first bit of data land from a CDN to the end user, and the number of requests, that's actually coming from the IPFS gateways, where the IPFS gateways are now using Saturn as a backend to help bootstrap both the Saturn network, but also to help accelerate the, uh, the IPFS gateways themselves. Next, I want to talk a little bit about compute over data. Um, I had mentioned that there are three main pillars here, and storage and retrieval really are about building out hardware. It's getting us both the infrastructure to store massive amounts of data and the distribution to push that data out into the world. So when we think about compute over data, the reason it's important to think about these protocols and invest in making them work is because data has gravity. Once data is in a location, it can actually be expensive to move that data from one location to another. If you've ever tried moving, a large file, uh, not like gigabytes, if you talk about like terabytes or petabytes, anything in the big data realm, you quickly run into an issue where their pipes aren't just physically are not fast enough or fat enough to allow you to have like performant retrieval out of a data center. So instead, what you want to do is take the compute and move it down to wherever the data is. Both in the storage, handily for us in the storage markets, Filecoin's protocol has hardware co-located with all of the hard drives due to the sealing process. So miners have GPUs and CPUs sitting next to all of their hard drives where you can have these compute protocols land. Even in Saturn, in the software, uh, it's called Station, that the Filecoin Saturn protocol uses, there is actually uh, a way that you can later upgrade it to have compute also run side by side. So you can turn all of the Saturn nodes into effectively a giant Cloudflare worker. So, I think this is really important in terms of adding utility, not just from saying like philosophically people will want to store and retrieve stuff, but really getting us all the way down to like what are all the functions that people are looking for from the cloud. The reason I have this triangle on the right is just to highlight some of the complexity though when we think about things in a Web3 context. When we talk about uh, normal cloud compute, we're really operating on this bottom right side of the triangle where it's fully trusted, but we get this like, massive boost to performance because we aren't having to verify what Amazon or someone else is doing. When we think about compute, we think that there's basically going to be a bit of a trilemma in the same way that you see it for blockchains, except in this case, it is around compute. And since Juan came up with this, we call it Juan's triangle. Um, so in the bottom right uh, is performance, and so you can make a choice to optimize purely for performance and work with someone that you completely trust. But sometimes you don't want to have all of your computation land with someone and have to trust them, so maybe you need to optimize for verifiability. Unfortunately, for those use cases, maybe this is credit scoring or something more sensitive or uh, triggering transfers of value. Uh, for those verifiability use cases, you have to add cryptographic cycles, which means you're inherently trading off on performance because doing something is more expensive than doing nothing. The same is true if we think about privacy. You could fully use fully homomorphic encryption to do private computation, but of course, adding those cryptographic cycles are always going to be more expensive. And so as a result, we see a wide array of teams that are tackling different parts of this uh, triangle. Teams like Lurk are working on programmatic or verifiable programs uh, using like recursive snarks. Teams like Zama are working on fully homomorphic encryption. And teams like Bakalyao are actually tackling the far right to enable more traditional computation on top of distributed data. OK, so that has rounded out all of these three pillars that we're building on off-chain services. I now want to touch a little bit on some of the things that have come more recently and show how all of these pieces connect. Um, and that starts with the FEM. So maybe it's worth first starting with the question of, what is the FEM? The FEM is a WASM-based VM designed as a hypervisor. Sounds kind of technical, but what that means is the base layer of the Filecoin VM is a Wasm VM, and we can add other runtimes sitting on top. And so in March of, la or March of this year, so about a month ago, uh, we've released the first runtime deployed on top, which is the FEVM, meaning that you can port your Solidity contracts to run on the Filecoin network. Now, it's interesting because the Filecoin network is not like a normal blockchain. Yes, you can do your normal like DeFi and things like that, but more importantly, we have these services that are anchoring into the same shared block space. So now you can combine the program or programmability of what you might expect out of a blockchain with the actual transfer of value to services that you can run. So a good example here might be auto-renewing of deals. 
Maybe you've stored 10 copies of your data on the network, and now you can deposit money into a smart contract to say, always make sure that there's 10 copies of data on this network, and automatically set a bounty to reward someone for renewing one if one of them falls offline. Previously not possible, now possible with the FVM. This also sets the stage for things like multi-currency payments. So if we want to enable deals to be paid not natively in Filecoin, but be paid in USDC, or maybe it's bridged from Ethereum, we can now support currency payments and multiple, uh, multiple tokens. This also allows uh, or sets the stage for things like DeFi on Filecoin, not necessarily trying to tackle Wall Street in general, but really focusing on our own local economy. As I mentioned, we have 3,600 storage provider nodes. We have about 2,100 uh, retrieval market nodes. All of those are data centers. Those are businesses that have cash flows that are looking for financing. When people talk about real world assets, quite often they're talking about how do we get crypto or how do we get businesses to adopt crypto rails? And in some senses, Filecoin's asking the other question, which is what if we could home grow a bunch of businesses that are natively integrated with crypto rails and then just deploy the DeFi on top? So uh, I think the FEM, we've just touched the surface, but this is, I think, where we start seeing the connective tissue between all of these off-chain services and the ability to program and write uh, transfers of value around that as well. And this leads into uh, the last major component of the Filecoin roadmap, which is interplanetary consensus. If you've been listening to everything I've been saying, one question that may be sticking in your head is, well, how is this ever going to scale? Isn't the blockchain just going to get congested? And so interplanetary consensus, I realize this is a busy slide, is our answer to the question of like, how do you scale blockchains to actually serve Web2 scale workloads? So the answer here is, if you really take a step back and think about it from first principles, there are certain contradictory properties that blockchains really need to serve web applications. At a base layer, you want high security. If you're going to secure tens of millions of dollars to billions of dollars in TVL, you want to make sure that you have global censorship resistance, security, all of that good stuff. But on the other end of the spectrum, if you're going to have a CDN that needs to have content delivery in under 10 milliseconds, there's no way that you can get global consensus by going around the world. You physically will lose that battle just because the speed of light is a limiting constraint. And so motivated based off that, it means that you need the ability to basically operate at different orders of magnitude, or different latencies and different levels of security. IBC allows us to do this programmatically. We can scale on demand to spin up subnets, and they can be configured however we need them per each operator's uh, choice. You can choose a subnet to be designed as a rollup or as a sidechain. You can choose different consensus modes. You could have a Tenderman subnet that would allow a native bridge to IBC in the, or through IBC to the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, subnet or IPC allows for native messaging up and down the hierarchy. And because we can make these tuning and these trade-offs between security and scalability, we can take the high throughput parts of our applications and push them into the lower subnets that have less security, um, while still maintaining the value in the parts that are more secure. IPC, in combination with the retrieval markets, the compute, and the storage, is how we see our smart contract layer being able to actually support web scale computation. So putting it all together, Falcon's master plan is to acquire hardware and data and build out web scale services on top. The core services that we've talked about, storage that exists today, continues to have improvements, retrieval, uh, which is currently in alpha through the retrieval markets with Saturn, coming out later this year, compute over data. There's about 15, 20 teams that are working on this that are all various stages of deployment, but continue to make progress. The FEM gives us programmability, which allows us to compose these different services and write value transfer between all of these different protocols that are being built. And lastly, with IPC, we actually can scale the network to be able to do this sort of uh, computation without blowing up the gas fees. Um, so anyways, uh, this was a very, very quick primer. We have a bunch of different blog posts. Feel free to catch me later. Um, but yeah, I think this is how we see Web3 actually being able to serve Web2 scale loads. And more importantly, with Filecoin and the FEM, we can bring this to all of Web3. If you're in the Ethereum economy and you want to stake your ETH, you should be able to send your staked ETH to fund the ongoing archival of ETH storage. And now with programmability, we can actually do that natively through bridges. Uh, and I'll thank you for uh, listening to my talk. Mm -hmm.